Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark. Every Monday, we try to bring you some exciting results from the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. But today, we've got a little bit different show because my guest today is going to talk with me about the recent Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which was held last month in March in Houston, Texas. This is an annual gathering of about 2,000 researchers, and basically they cover a whole variety of the recent discoveries. So let me welcome to the show Dr. David Trang, who is a postdoctoral fellow within HIGEP. Um, you've been on the show before, David, so thank you for coming back again. Well, thank you for having me. And David and I went to the same conference, and what we're trying to do today is basically review some of the highlights. You attended some of the meetings which I missed. I attended some of the meetings which you missed. So we want to have a conversation today, Dave, about what exactly you found interesting. And of course, one of the real things, fabulous planetary exploration, a ton of really exciting images. So yep. what did, first of all, what did you think of the, the conference? Oh, the conference is always a great time. It's, it's you know, you, it's, some people have kind of put it in a way, it's like, oh, it's kind of a, like a mini reunion. You get to see like everyone that you worked with, your friends, and you, you talk personally, but also you talk science, you find out what they're doing, and then you guys can catch up, and, um, but also talk about like new collaboration ideas. Such. Yeah. And it's such a, I absolutely love it. It was a great time. Yeah, I know what you mean. I've been going to this conference since 1979. Oh, yeah. So it really <laughs> is like homecoming week, and you right. sort of see the, the graduate students who become postdocs, who become faculty, who have their own students, as well as, of course, enjoy some of the really exciting advances in right. planetary exploration with all of the recent NASA missions, as well as the European Space Agency. Um, but the new collaborations is something also really important, isn't it? Oh, for sure. It's um, every time I go there, when I get there, you know, it's always you, you sit in these talks and you learn about everything that people are doing, and you just and then somehow you these these light bulbs just go off in your head, and you're like, oh my god, that's a great idea. I can connect my work and their work, and then it just kind of comes together. Or you're like, oh, there's kind of something that I could do to fill in the gap that this person's missing. I'm gonna go work on that. So it's a great place to come up with like ideas. And I always have like 10 ideas jotted down. By great, time. and I mentioned so. uh, earlier, about 2,000 people attended the conference, but what kind of disciplines would be represented there? Um, you mean like everything, like the different fields? Yeah, what fields? Uh, it's, I mean, you always, you have like everything from geology to um, people who work on geophysics, so everything on the surface to the interior. Uh, it, and you have people working on dynamics, and it's just amazingly and, and group, then of great. And petrologists. And there are some people who um, work at the moon or right. they are out, out of solar system. Yeah, and I, I like that there's these different groups. You know, you have the, you have the moon people, and then you have the um, airless bodies like Mercury and, and all asteroids, the decent people Mars, working on and, Mars. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you have the people who just work on the outer solar system, so like um, Saturn and the moons of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, Pluto. You know, it's all that's great. It's a lot of different groups, but we all tend to come together. Well, as I said at the start of the show, I found one of the great things about last month's conference were all the wonderful images. So maybe if we can just move to the first image. Here's a smorzborg uh, for this show of just spectacular scenes. Um, can you tell the viewers what it is we're actually looking at right now? Well, it looks like we're looking at um, images that are coming back from this uh, mission called Juno. Uh, Juno is a Jupiter orbiter. Uh, its, its objective is to kind of learn about the atmospherics of Jupiter. So what we're looking at is this beautiful uh, image of the clouds above Jupiter, and of course, this amazing. is a real image. Yep. It's not computer generated, yep. although 
I uh, would understand that some of the colors are computer enhanced. Right, yeah. So, I mean, if you were at Jupiter, you wouldn't see exactly this. Uh, but <laughs> You'd be dead for radiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah you maybe, yeah. <laughs> but it, you, would, you wouldn't see these nice, vibrant colors, you know, that kind of comes mm -hmm. from the camera and kind of boosting these colors out. And we do that just to help, you know, to understand what we're seeing and what's actually there. Right. So we And use... I know that you and I are not atmospheric yeah. scientists. <laughs> right. right. So maybe we should go on to uh, uh, the next image because they're absolutely stunning. Um, I hope that the viewers can recognize this planet, which is Saturn. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about Saturn and its rings here. Um, this is from Cassini. Uh, I think that's one of, the, one of the things that we should uh, appreciate is Cassini ended its mission, uh, I think, last year. Um, so at LPSC, at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, we got a, an overview of uh, everything that we've learned from the Cassini mission. Um, so it brought back all these beautiful images, and we've learned a lot about the rings, and we've learned a lot about uh, the, of Saturn and their moons themselves. Which, um, for example, one of the cool things that I've learned about the rings is that it's about 200 million years old. It's very, very young. That means dinosaurs were, were roaming Earth when oh, these I, rings were created. You, and you, op is... you opened Pandora's box there. <laughs> How do you know that the rings of Saturn are 200 million years old? Well, I think they use brightness as what they use okay. to understand. Um, I should at least note that I'm not a Saturn person, but I surely do love and appreciate the work that comes out of there, and I really enjoy uh, what I've learned from them. So I'm kind of paraphrasing from what I've learned, uh -huh. but I believe it's the brightness and how, how quickly it darkens. Because what, what I heard was that basically, if they were as old as the solar system, the amount of dust that's still within the solar system would have darkened mm -hmm. each of the rings. So are they... Um, continually being renewed, you know? I mean, so if you say you're not a Saturn oh, expert, nor am I. Yeah. But um, again, we can enjoy For the most part, senses. most of the ring is not being renewed for the very main part of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and they've said, you know, is it going to dissipate anytime soon? The answer is no, not in our lifetime, not in our, you know, kids and kids' lifetime. So it'll be there for a while, uh, or at least a very long time. Um, but there's only one, there's a, at least one ring that we know of, or uh, one of the main rings, which is called the E ring, which is being renewed. Uh, basically, you have this moon Enceladus. It's, it's shooting out these plumes of ice, and it's creating, and is actually contributing to the ring. Which right. is really I think we'll see an image of Enceladus in a few slides' time. But let's go on to the next one, because I think that's also uh, another Saturnian ring image. Um, but this looks quite different. Um, do you know what this actually shows? Yeah, I think so. You're, um, you're, this is an eclipse, basically, with Saturn in front of the sun. Um, oh, okay. And what it's really showing is the ring system a lot better. So the, the outside, that very fuzzy, the furthest ring, um, is that E ring that's coming from Enceladus. Uh, what's really cool is that you can see that it's bright on one side or on two of the sides. So on the very top of this and the south of Saturn, you can see that it's really bright there. Um, and that's where Enceladus is most closest to Saturn and most furthest. And that's where, it, you know, it kind of tells you when is it most active. And it's more related to its orbit. All right. And to remind the viewers, Saturn is much larger than the Earth. Uh, oh, although, much, 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 yeah. much, Although much lower density it could float if you had a big enough bucket of water, for yeah. example. Um, and so we're seeing... Uh, a different aspect of the structure of the rings because, in essence, it's backlit, right? Yep. And, and the darker parts, they are genuine gaps. So if you were looking with a much finer telescope, you could actually see stars passing mm -hmm. behind it. And at least at this resolution, there's a little white dot towards the left-hand side of the screen. Is that a moon or is that a star? I believe so. <laughs> I can't see in this picture. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, I think it's one of the Saturnian. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, you mentioned some of the moons. I think the next slide will also show us uh, an, another view of oh, the yeah. rings, right? This uh, is beautiful. These are amazing. Now, again, remind the viewers, these are real photographs. These yep. are not computer-generated, even though they're computer-enhanced. 
What is it we're looking at here? So these, this is as Cassini was uh, moving through the rings. Um, what you can see here is that on the top and the bottom, these are actual part of the rings. So the rings are actually made of all these small particles, about centimeters to meter size. Of about 90% of it is ice, water ice. Um, so what you're seeing in the middle is you're seeing one of these moons. Um, and they're, they're pretty much rubble piles. And as it moves across, you can see that its gravity from this moon is actually affecting the ring and causing these beautiful wave patterns. So the wave on the left-hand side of the middle of the screen is actually due to the gravity of the moon in orbit around Saturn yep. within the rings, and it's dragging these fine particles. Do you know how thick some of the rings are themselves? Uh, I don't. I don't recall how big the actual rings are between gaps. Is that what you mean? No, or... the, the thickness. Oh, I don't remember how thick it was. Okay. Do you remember? I've, I've heard it's sort of less than a hundred meters or something. Um, I right. saw one of the presentations where they had right at equinox, mm -hmm. uh, Saturn had its rings perpendicular to the oh, sun, yeah. and it was casting these shadows. Oh yeah, it was beautiful. Of parts of the, the ring plane itself uh, was seen in sort of three dimensions. And they were able to infer that the thickness of the rings was of the order of a few hundred meters. Yeah. And yet the hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers across and that sort of thing, really quite magnificent. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I think they said it was because of the slightly elliptical orbit or the, the orbit of the moon itself is a little bit is not like within the same plane as the ring. I so see. it's really interesting that you can see some structure yeah. inside. It's Somebody who studies the orbital dynamics yeah. would have had a field day on that. Let's oh, look yeah, at another sure. slide. The, the, these are so pretty, you want to take a look. Uh, and this one, this is, again, uh, a little reminder. This is a real image. Yep. Um, and to me, this looks like you've got Saturn's rings running from left uh, all the way um, out towards the center. But you've got three moons here, right? Mm -hmm. do, do you know what the moons are? Uh, I'd rather not throw out the guess, but uh, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> OK, well, my, my guess, and it purely is a guess, the large one is Titan. Yep. OK, uh, and I infer it's Titan simply because we can't see the surface, right. and Titan has an atmosphere twice as thick as the Earth's atmosphere. Um, if we can go back to the uh, previous slide, we will be able to see, not that one either, um, we'll be able to see that we've got, there we go, um, a number of, of moons. The middle size one, I think, is Enceladus. It looks like so with those, uh, what we tiger call tiger stripes. stripes. Yep, yep. yep. And I've got no idea at all what the small little white dot oh, yeah. is, <laughs> just to the right of the ring yeah. plane. But, um, Saturn has a lot of moons, and it's it's... You know, there's there's mnemonics to memorize them, but some of the smaller yeah, ones. I believe are not there's different. like 65 different moons that yeah. have been discovered, and you know, Cassini, which was in orbit between 2005 and 2017, more than doubled the number of moons which we actually recognize around yeah. Saturn. So, uh, if you were studying um, the interaction between the moons uh, and the Saturn's ring, that would be a wonderful place to go. But um, we're getting close to the uh, mid-show break, David. Yeah. Um, when we come back, you can actually start quizzing me about some of the sessions which I attended. <laughs> so uh, in the interim, let me just remind our viewers, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today is Dr. David Trang. And David and I are reminiscing about the 49th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which was held in Houston last month. So we'll be back in about a minute's time. So see you then. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. 
Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrieli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests. The students of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark, and this week I'm talking to Dr. David Trang, who is a postdoctoral researcher within HIGP, and we're reminiscing about last month's 49th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference held in Houston, Texas. So I said we're going to go on to the sessions which I attended, but mm -hmm. there's one image, David, that I really want our viewers right. to see again. So if we can go to the next image, and this is of the nucleus of a comet, yep. right? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, this is a 67P. Um, this was visited by the European Space Agency mission called Rosetta. And what they tried to do was they tried to put a lander here. Um, and then with the actual orbiter, they actually took a lot of images. Uh, we've learned a great deal from uh, Rosetta. Uh, it's, it's, the images are beautiful. There's so much change that occurs as it approaches the sun. Um, and they have they've images and documented like the changes over time. And you can, they actually showed like little animations. And you're like, wow, you know, you see dust so, moving so around, pits opening. Of it's changes. It's Is it, uh, we all know the tail of a comet, for mm -hmm. example. Is that the kind of thing they're recognizing? Because here we're seeing an object that's about half the size of, of Oahu, so mm -hmm. it's quite small. What changes can you see on the surface? Uh, yeah, we, you can actually see dust moving, moving across. Um, and I think you've you've mentioned you've seen dunes. Have I've seen have, dunes have on, those? Have they yeah. seen them moving? Um, what, once in a right. while, yes. And they've also seen landslides and oh, um, right, and cliffs. Face falling, falling and things yeah. like that. But yes. one of the ones I really enjoyed was just seeing these little pits just opening up. And it's just amazing because what you're having is just volatile just escaping on some of them. Uh -huh. and, and these pits that are opening, it's just, it's just, it's like we're seeing geology in action, something sure. that's not very, you know, common on Earth. You know, it's not, you don't see an action quite, you know, frequently like on this comet. It's just all happening so quickly and so fast. And one of the things which I found really exciting at the conference was there's a proposal for NASA to send another spacecraft back to the same comet. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's the idea of, you know, going back and doing a sample return. Um, I think we're kind of starting moving towards the age of, hey, you know, we've got all these images. Let's move on to imaging and getting the samples back. Kind of like what we're doing with Osiris Rex, trying to get a sample there. We have Hayabusa 2 trying to get a sample from an asteroid. Um, so we're, and then now you know NASA is pushing the whole idea of getting samples from the Moon, from Mars. So it's we're kind of moving into the age right. of sample return. And, and within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, we've got some of the really best equipment: a transmission electron microscope, a right? Iron microprobe, uh, various other hardware that really could help the university be one of the leaders, right, in yeah, terms of for sure. analysis. And we have some of the greatest leaders um, in, our, in our department, um, in our institute, that actually do you know, push the, si the limits of what we understand from Including this. yourself, because you're a science, participating oh. scientist on yeah. the SO. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, All right, so let's change gears. You can start asking me oh, yes. about some of the things which I saw, because although it was a, a single science conference. There were like six concurrent sessions. Oh, yes. You can't attend everything. You spend most of your time out in the hallway catching up on news and planning your research. So um, if we go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about this one. Oh, yeah. You, so you've gone to the lunar session. Um, you, uh, Jack Schmidt was there. Jack Schmidt. And for the audience, the viewers, Jack Schmidt, 12th person to walk on the moon, oh, the yeah. only geologist. What I really like him, and, and here he is, uh, along with Gene Cernan, uh, they landed in this place called Taurus Electro Valley. And what is really fantastic is that Jack 
still attends the Lunar Science Conference because he's an interested geologist. Yeah. And, and you may have been in the same place uh, at the time when he gave his talk, but he's got this wonderful sort of saying where somebody's proposing a new idea about, say, the formation of one of the craters at Taurus Litro, and he's saying, yeah, so, well, it didn't look like that when I was there. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's just so right. disarming sort of thing. But uh, here's the, uh, uh, the lunar roving vehicle and the descent module. But I want to show you the next picture because there really has been a sort of a revolution in terms of our understanding of, of the landing site. So if we can go to the next slide, what we will see, here we've got an orbital view mm -hmm. of the landing site, right? And um, back in December of 1972, when the mission took place, the astronauts, Schmidt and Cernan, were able to drive in that rover um, three different times. So uh, they went out on three extravehicular activities, or EVAs. And these show uh, how far they went. And, and sometimes they went, you know, like uh, 15 kilometers. Oh, yeah. Around. And, you know, We've got some of our former graduate students, Mark Robinson, for right. example, took this picture with the camera he built to put on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And there's this synergy between what Jack Schmidt saw at the time, mm -hmm. what uh, you can see from orbit now, as well as what people, including Jeff Taylor at the university, are understanding about the, the petrology or the chemistry mm -hmm. of the rocks. So 45 years after this mission, hearing from the astronaut who made the actual observation, absolutely incredible sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And, and I think what's interesting is that, you know, he always gives the first talk. And when he's there, he's always doing new science, new work on the Apollo 7 site. Like, he didn't just stop doing science when he came back from the moon. He's still going today, yeah. and he's still producing new stuff. In fact, he got an entire session to himself, and you attended that session. Uh, some um, of it, yes. Yeah, I, I got yeah. lost when they were talking about the petrology or the chemistry oh, of the rock. Yes. So I went off and did something else. Right. But uh, yeah. you know, th there was a lot of interest. And yes, I also heard that you know, they are trying to develop new ways of analyzing subsamples from that particular mission, whether it's the soil mm -hmm. called the regolith, or whether it's some of the rocks, and what the age differences might mean in terms of the regional geology. So it's really very, very interesting. Oh yeah, very. And it's, I, I, I think it's also incredible that Jack still attends, and it's great for all young scientists, you know, graduate students and undergraduates. You know, they come to this and they're like, oh my gosh, a real Apollo astronaut is here right. presenting <laughs> science. And after the session, you see these kids all going up, running for pictures. And, and indeed. And, um, and it's a great inspiration to still have him there. One of our former guests, uh, Casey Hannibal, mm -hmm. for example, she's a graduate student at the university. And she was like with these other students. In all, she wants to be an astronaut talking to an Apollo astronaut. Yeah. It's, it's really something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience to meet somebody who's been there. It's, yeah, it's been there. also really weird because, you, you know, it's not a very everyday occurrence. Been there, done that <laughs> yeah, sort of thing. Right. Hopefully we'll have more astronauts going back to the moon very soon. Um, we've got a wonderful backdrop here, but let's go on to the next slide, which is also the same backdrop. And um, let me tell you some of the results from the Mars rovers. Yeah, I, I've completely missed those <laughs> sessions. <laughs> One of the rovers' opportunity landed on Mars mm -hmm. January 25th, 2004. It is still going. It has wow. driven 46 kilometers. This isn't from the opportunity landing site. This is Gale Crater, where the other rover yep. called Curiosity is. But where's Matt Damon? <laughs> or Mark Watney, or whatever. Yeah. Here we're seeing um, across about 30 kilometers towards the rim of this big crater mm -hmm. called Gale. And so the, the geology that the rovers are showing us has gone way beyond, say, what we were able to obtain from orbit, um, that they're doing a lot of really detailed sampling of various types of minerals. They're doing uh, some sedimentology 
because this particular, the floor of this crater used to be a lake. Mm -hmm. And Festival. so you've got all these sediments. But um, the, the Curiosity rover, which took this picture, has been operating for over 2,000 days now. So wow. it hasn't caught up with opportunity, but uh, which has done over 5,000 days. Um, but nevertheless, in the foreground, we've got some uh, hematite rich rocks, which is what we're seeing in the, the black area, but it's these lakes. Which yeah. we're so we're getting a completely new understanding of what the climate of Mars was like, perhaps three and a half, 3.5, 3.6 billion years ago. So is, is the rover still climbing up? The, the mountain? Is that it's still well, on, you it's say a continued st objective? Or? You say still. Um, as a Martian geologist, I'm quite frustrated because it's not driving fast enough. Oh, yeah. Uphill. Um, it's located within this crater called Gale. Mm -hmm. There's this big five kilometer high mountain. And we really want to understand what that mountain's made of. And you can only tell by being there. Um, it hasn't got there after mm -hmm. five years of driving, but it will get there within the next year or two. Opportunity rover, the other side of the, the planet in the Sinus Meridiani, is still driving like crazy. It's going down um, gullies. It's going across the floor. It's been exploring this eroded rim of an mm -hmm. old meteorite crater that might be four billion years old. Wow. And it's just like doing field geology. So um, each of the rovers have different types of instruments on board. Curiosity is spending a lot more time drilling into the rocks, trying to better understand what the chemistry is. Whereas Opportunity, which is still basically just uh, sort of late 1990s technology, now it's basically running just with the cameras. And yeah. so they're going like crazy to some of these amazing places. And it's amazing that it exceeded its life, like by years. I mean... It was designed it was... to work on Mars for 90 days. Yeah. Well, that's... It's, I think we're beyond uh, that. <laughs> it's years. over 5,000 yeah. days. Wow. Now. And, and so, um, yeah, the, the engineers who built that particular spacecraft really should be congratulated and also the science team led yeah, by sure. a guy called Steve Squires. They've just done a fabulous job with the opportunity and the, the, the sister rover called Spirit. That survived for over seven years. So anyway, uh, as, as the viewers hopefully can tell, there was so much which uh, we, we saw. Um, we haven't even got to the end of the slides. Uh, unfortunately, we've got to the end of the show. So let me just remind you, you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and I've been having a conversation today with Dr. David Trang, who is a postdoctoral researcher, about just a fraction of the things which we found of interest uh, in the conference. Um, David, thank you very much for well, joining for me in me. this conversation. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show, and hopefully we can invite you back some later time. So anyway, Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll be back next Monday, so please stay tuned then. Goodbye for now.